In a fit of violent rage, a man shoots a six-year-old girl, her parents, and a neighbor after a ball rolls into his yard. What is the world coming to? Let's talk about it. This is Criminal Justice Corner, where we discuss true crime stories, we give you the real details surrounding what occurred, and just in case you find yourself in the same situation, we give you actionable advice and tips on how you can potentially get yourself out. I'm Dr. Jennifer Matthews, the host of the Criminal Justice Corner. I have 16 years of experience in the field of criminal justice and a doctoral degree in the criminal justice field. I'm also an expert in video evidence. Our Criminal Justice Corner's door sponsor of the day is Dr. Jennifer Matthews Consulting. Dr. Jennifer Matthews Consulting is a driving force behind digital transformations to solve cases quicker with body-worn cameras, closed-circuit television media, and expert witness testimony. You can find them on the web at drjennifermatthews.com. Today, I have with me a special guest, Tori Houseworth. Ms. Houseworth is a police officer out of Northwest Indiana, a crime analyst and instructor of criminal justice. Tori, can you tell us a little bit about you? Hi. Um, prior to relocating to Northwest Indiana, uh, I was a former federal police officer, and I have about 15 years worth of experience in the field, and I've worked in various different divisions of enforcement, and I'm glad to be here today. Tori, I appreciate you for being my special guest today. Let's dive into this episode. The incident began on April 20th, 2023 in North Carolina when a basketball rolled into suspect Robert Lewis Singletary's, age 24, his yard, and he yelled at the kids who went to retrieve it. One of the kids told his father, who then went to Singletary's house and said something to the effect of, stop cussing my kids out. If you got a problem, come to me and we can work it out. This was according to three neighbors. Tori, to me, this is normal reaction from a parent if a stranger yelled at their child. What are your thoughts about this? I think it is a normal reaction uh, as a parent, but unfortunately, we live in a society now where people are very high-tempered and the smallest thing can set an individual off now. And I think this is a, an example of that happening. I have to agree with you. And unfortunately, that is the case and that is what happened in this situation. Now, the neighbors go on to tell police that Singletary then walked inside his house, came out with a gun, and opened fires, fire at the neighbors. He wounded a six-year-old girl and her parents. Neighbors describe the scene as he ran down the street, firing at a neighbor before walking up to Kinsley White, who was the six-year-old girl, who was playing outside in her yard. He then shot White in the face before turning the gun on her father, who was just trying to protect her. It was later learned that Singletary allegedly kept shooting until he ran out of bullets. Let me say that one more time. He kept shooting until he ran out of bullets. Imagine what would have happened if he had reloaded. Just, Tori, what are you thinking about that at that moment? I think had he been able to reload, he would have kept going. It, exactly. It, it clear, it's clear that he was basically attempting to go on a, a spree, a shooting spree. Exactly. And we've definitely been seeing a lot of that lately in the United States. Correct. Yeah. So thankfully, no one was killed during this incident. And it's quite possible that the reason for that is because he didn't reload. But to be clear, the six-year-old girl, Kinsley White, her mother, Ashley Hildebrand, and her father, William James White, were not involved with the ball rolling in, in, his, to, in his yard. They did not uh, go to his house or approach him in any way. They were just outside grilling and got caught in the crossfire when he ran down the street. So what do you think about that? So they weren't even involved in anything that happened. They were just outside, you know, enjoying the day. Yeah, I mean, call them innocent bystanders at, at, at that point, you know, you're in a neighborhood. So you're going to have people who are out in the in the area going about their daily um, day, daily routines. 
Yeah. And also to me, that tells me that his anger was misplaced, not saying that anyone deserved to be shot. But at that point, he just I feel like he saw red and anybody that he saw in his path was going to get shot at that point. Absolutely. He had no regard for life at, at, in that moment. Exactly. That's exactly how I see it. So there was a fourth person involved in this shooting, a neighbor by the name of Derek Kenneth Prather. Prather was shot at by Singletary, but he was not hit. So when interviewed, six-year-old Kinsley had questions for Singletary. She asked, why did you shoot me? Why did you shoot my daddy? I couldn't get inside in time, so he just shot my daddy in the back. So just to hear that trauma that she had to witness, it will forever stain her life. She will need therapy to move past this in a healthy way. Having to watch her parent, let alone both of her parents, be shot over the actions of one psychotic man is just unfathomable to me. Kinsley's mother, her mother was interviewed, and she stated that doctors had to remove bullet fragments from Kinsley's cheek and that her own elbow was grazed by a bullet. Tori, you're a parent. Do you have anything to add regarding this? I, I I agree with you that it's just sad. And the girl, she's definitely going to have to uh, seek therapy. It's it's going to be ingrained in, in her head. This is probably going to be one of the most traumatic experience for her. And not, not just her, but all the other kids that were outside playing. Um, and I, I just, I, I hope that they can move beyond this, that entire neighborhood. You are so right, because it, it didn't just affect her. It affected everybody that was outside that day. And a lot of times um, I'm, you hear about survivor's guilt or survivor's remorse because Kinsley was not involved in an incident, but those kids who ball ran, you know, rolled into the yard, they're going to feel like it might they might feel like it was their fault that, you know, the other people were shot at or got shot. I I totally agree. And also, I think that this is going to create a sense of discomfort for them, too, because home is home and everyone should feel safe at home. And now this they will have to struggle to move beyond. It, it's definitely going to take some time if their families decide to stay but it's, it's going to be a challenge. Right. And then that neighborhood, that block is going to be forever changed because of one man's inhumane actions on one day. Absolutely. Yeah. So immediately after the shooting, Singletary went on the run. Police in Gaston County partnered with the United States Marshals Regional Fugitive Tax Force to aid in searching for Singletary. At the time of this shooting, incident, Singletary was out awaiting trial on felony charges from an incident in December 2022 in which he allegedly beat his girlfriend in the head with a mini sledgehammer and forbade her from leaving his apartment until she had cleaned up the evidence. So I do have the details of that incident. So at approximately 9.30 a.m. on December 2nd, 2022, Gaston police officers responded to a local hospital after a victim of an assault called 911 to report the incident. During the investigation, the victim told officers that she was at Singletary's apartment on Armstrong Park Road a few hours earlier and that he struck her in the back of the head with a mini sledgehammer. Now, we all know that's a, 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 a weapon. <laughs> and it, if it, you're hit in the back of the head with it, it's hard, it's heavy, it can cause a lot of damage. So the victim said that after being struck, she immediately felt dizzy, and disoriented, and that she was be bleeding profusely from the back of her head. The victim further stated that Singletary told her that she could not leave until she had cleaned up all the evidence from the assault. The victim complied with Singletary's demands, and he allowed her to leave the apartment approximately two hours after the assault occurred. So she's bleeding, she's dizzy, she's feeling disoriented, and he did not allow her to get immediate medical attention. So after she left the apartment, she immediately drove to the hospital and called 911 to report the assault. Gaston police officers obtained an arrest warrant for Singletary, charging him with assault with intent to inflict serious injury, kidnapping, and communicating threats. Singletary was arrested at his apartment later that afternoon. During the arrest, officers located evidence from that assault, including 
finding that mini sledgehammer that is believed to have been the, uh, the weapon used to assault the victim. Singletary was being held on $250,000 secured bond, but as we know, he was later released. Now, Tori, you're a police officer. What is going through your mind at this moment when you hear of his history and learning that out, while out on bond, he has committed another violent and heinous act? Definitely. So I, my, the first thing that came to my mind was if he has domestic previous domestic violence charges, why is he in possession of a weapon? Because in the state of Florida, and like most other states, if you are, you have a domestic violence charge or even convicted of it, you are not allowed to have a weapon. So that was the first issue that I had. And I also read um, some data that stated that in 2016, he had a similar charge as well. Um, for a deadly weapon and inflicting serious bodily injury or harm um, back in 2016 as well. So to me, it, it demonstrates that he is one, in fact, a criminal and his behavior has just gotten progressively worse. I have to agree with you wholeheartedly. And following up on what you said, his criminal history does include an arrest for an assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill or inflict serious injury um, in ho Halloween 2016, according to the North Carolina Department of Adult Correction. He was convicted in that incident in neighboring Mc Mc Mecklenburg County the following year and released from prison in September of 2020. So Correct. he just had like back to back to back uh, incidents going on here. And it's clear that his time behind bars is not having any effect on his behavior and that he has committed to his life of crime like a criminal, uh, cr a career criminal, that that's what he wants to do, that he's not getting any better. He's not seeking help. He's not trying to improve himself in any way. He's just doing whatever it is that he wants to do and living this violent lifestyle, anger lifestyle and just wreaking havoc on the people around him, whether he knows them or not. Absolutely. And to another thing, Dr. Matthews, that surprises me is that they didn't give him more time. I'm really surprised that they that he did not get more time for that because also not allowing her to leave the apartment until she cleaned up the evidence, that, that in the state of Florida, that's considered as false imprisonment or like here in Indiana, that would be criminal confinement. So, and, and I, I see like intimidation along with all of that. So I personally feel like he should have gotten more time than what he did. Well, that case is still ongoing. That case with the mini sledgehammer, the 2016 uh, case is the one that he did serve time on. And that was assault with a deadly weapon. So two yes. different cases, you know what I mean? So he has, a history of this, but they, like you're saying, giving him little time. So maybe he feels like he's getting away with something. Absolutely. I, I think the 2016 one though, that the one that he was convicted of, I think that he should have gotten more time because if you look at that time, okay. window, that's not a lot for something. It's definitely weapon. Yeah. Four years approximately. Mm -hmm. That's definitely not a lot of time. We, we know people get more time for jaywalking, <laughs> you know, that exactly. is it's, definitely not a lot of time at all. Correct. Definitely a pattern of negative criminal behavior going on in his, in his um, life and is escalating. So in those um, other cases, there were weapons, but they were not like guns. They were um, other weapons. Now he's using immediate weapons um, that can kill. Um, so those people live to tell about it. And with the gun, he fired until he ran out of bullets. So he was trying to kill people in these mm -hmm. incidents. Not saying he wasn't trying previously, but no one died. And this, this incident with the shooting, he was trying. It, it just didn't work. Absolutely. It's mens rea versus actus reus all the way. You know, total intent, knowing and intentional. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in the sh in the shooting incident, Singletary later turned himself into authorities, ending the manhunt. He faces charges of four counts of attempted murder, 
two counts of assault with a deadly weapon, and one count of possession of a firearm by a felon. So do you think those charges are appropriate or should they have added more? I think they're appropriate. Um, you know, I never try to question the other professionals that we work with in this this line of work. And I think, you know, a prosecutor is going to run with what they can run with. And okay. I, I think that that's probably the best that they could do based on the evidence. I, I can agree with that. I can definitely agree with that. And honestly, I'm just glad that he turned himself in because who knows how long it would have taken the police to find him if he stayed on the run. We know that criminals have friends in low places and they are, they're willing to hide them. They're willing to do things to help them evade the law. So I'm really glad that that he turned himself in and didn't have officers um, out there looking for him for months, for years, possibly. Um, because what he allegedly did was irrational, psychotic, and just simply careless. So I'm glad that he's no longer on the streets and out there um, to possibly wreak havoc on anyone else's life. Definitely. Yeah. So let's do some quick takeaways. So just because a ball rolls into your yard, it does not give you the right to, um, you know, inflict harm on that person. Just give them back the ball and, and go about your day because being quick to anger will get you nowhere fast. You can end up in jail or worse, depending on the situation. A second thing is if you have anger issues or you see a pattern of bad or negative behavior happening, seek assistance. Therapy is always my first recommendation and people think that therapy won't help them or it won't work, but I'm here to tell you that it is beneficial. People shy away from that or it has negative connotations, but therapy can help and it does work. Tori, what are some things you want people to take away from this episode? I, along with what you just mentioned, um, I think we definitely have to use our best judgment when it comes down to making decisions and also um, be mindful of taking the law into your own hands. And absolutely, um, I know for a fact, if I have an issue with my neighbor, I'm probably going to try to talk about it. But, as, you know, as previously mentioned, we don't we live in a society to where we have a lot of people who are high tempered. So you really don't know how someone's going to react. So use your best judgment and pick and choose your battles. Hey, is this, you know, a conversation that I want to have or, hey, do I really want to confront this person? OK, or if it's an ongoing issue, because it was noted that in this neighborhood that this guy was notorious for yelling at the kids whenever they were outside. So I, I probably would have documented it, even if it's just a simple uh, basic complaint and not, not a criminal complaint, but just a basic complaint to have something in writing like, Hey, this, this guy's causing us problems. Let, let's try to do something about it. Have something on record in case his behavior escalates. So that's kind of my biggest takeaway is just, knowing when to pick and choose your battles and don't take the law into your own hands. And I think in this case, Mr. Singletary decided to take his anger out and take the law into his own hands by a neighbor confront him. He was upset that a neighbor confronted him, came to his property. Absolutely. And I, I definitely like those takeaways. And I want to thank you for being my special guest today. And I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Matthews. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Jennifer Matthews and the podcast at Criminal Justice Corner on Instagram. Don't forget to visit our Criminal Justice Corner store sponsor of the day, Dr. Jennifer Matthews Consulting. Dr. Jennifer Matthews Consulting is a driving force behind digital transformations to solve cases quicker with body-worn cameras closed circuit television media, and expert witness testimony. You can find them on the web at drjenniferMatthews.com. I will see you next time on Criminal Justice Corner. New episodes are posted every Wednesday. Thank you for listening.